Quay, Nino Ho can count to your Kesiche. In Chi Ayim, no how to Nino Greetings, my name is Larry Spotted Crow Man from the Nipmuc Nation, and I'm also the director and founder of the Okiteo Cultural Center. And I'm happy to be here with you all today to share this land acknowledgement. And, um, and it's important to recognize that the land acknowledgement must always have action steps when we talk about land acknowledgements. And so when we think about Massachusetts, I want to give recognition to all the people that are here, the first people that were here, the Massachusetts tribe, starting on the east, my relatives of uh, the Massachusetts tribe. Moving inland, you have my nation, the Nipmuc people, people of the fresh water. And just south uh, of, of, of us all, and, and on the Cape and Islands, you have the Wampanoag Nation, Wampanoag Nation people. And all the way on the west, the western part of the state, you have the Stockbridge Muncie Nations. And all of our people are still here. This is where we lived our life. This is where we hunted and fished and raised our families, practiced our diplomacy, our governance, our science, cosmology. Uh, uh, storytelling and our traditions and our culture and we are still here our language is still here and our songs are still here so it's important to remember the land that we are all benefiting from today and Massachusetts being one of the most prosperous uh, states in the Union in terms of uh, history and, and, and science and, and unfortunately a lot of that went on without ind the indigenous people uh, they were they were forgotten in that in that story and so it's important that we remember them all as we continue to benefit from this land and the bounties and the sacrifices that indigenous people made. And so we say, and when we acknowledge this land, we speak in the Algonquin language. So I'll say a few more words and I will share that song. And we say, and so with closing, I will share a song and, and once again, uh, always remember that the land that we are on, we are all enjoying, indigenous people are still here, the Massachusetts, the Wampanoag, the Nipmuc, and the Stockbridge Muncie people who have been this land for, for thousands of years. And so I will share this song in honor of this land and in honor of all of the people who are here today that we must all come together in that reciprocity, that understanding, to take care of the land, to be the good stewards that my ancestors were and learn from each other and always, most importantly, allow Native people to be in that center of space that they have earned through the histories and the knowledge that was passed down. So we share. Once again, thank you, and I'm glad to share, and um, it's an honor to, to be able to share these words with you, and that we are still here to pass on our traditions, our culture, and our story, and I invite you all to be a part of that story and share with us.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Duclo Orcello, and as chair of the Board of Mass Humanities, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome each of you to this joyful celebration in honor of four outstanding champions of the humanities in public life. Each of tonight's honorees embodies the best of what the humanities have to offer, encouraging deep reflection, requiring attentive listening, calling for active engagement with others, grappling with ethics and choices in the face of injustice and inhumanity, seeking wisdom from those who have gone before, and telling stories of the past to inform and improve the present and the future. This is what the humanities are and do. This is what mass humanities champions and makes possible. This is what we celebrate tonight. You are joining us at a critical time in our nation, our world, and our commonwealth. The linked traumas of the pandemic, racial violence, economic precarity, climate change, and more have forced each of us to take stock of what matters and what role we will play in shaping a more just future, a more equitable future, a more secure future. At Mass Humanities, we have been asking these same questions. And in the last year, we have finalized and launched a courageous new strategic plan that engages these present realities and maps a variety of ways to meet this moment through and with the public humanities and with your help. We have set a course that is ambitious, yet rooted in our shared belief that the power and lessons of the humanities are needed now more than ever to soothe troubled souls, to open new lines of inquiry, to learn about one another's lives and dreams, to seek justice and truth, and fundamentally to strengthen the civic life we all share. As we think about the power of the humanities to transform, I am reminded of the words of Gloria Anzaldúa, poet, scholar, feminist, queer, Chicana, bilingual, woman, intellectual tour de force, and author of, among other works, Borderlands, La Frontera. Voyager, she writes, there are no bridges. One builds them as one walks. With the support of each of you here tonight, Mass Humanities is leading the way and building many bridges. Bridges between thought and action, bridges between individuals from all backgrounds and corners of our Commonwealth. Bridges between the ideas that move our hearts and minds and the organizations that can transform our lives and our communities. Please enjoy this unique and dynamic evening, learning about the joy and power of the public humanities and celebrating our honorees. Thank you so much for being here and thank you in advance for spreading the word about mass humanities. Without your support, we can't bring our vision to life. Good evening, it's wonderful to be with you all tonight as we celebrate 2021 Governor's Awards in the Humanities. Every year we take this pause to appreciate the people who contribute to this world we live in, to reflect on the work that we've done for the last year, and to introduce it to more of you. It has been a particularly trying year, and that's why I feel the need to pause even more, think about this work, and lift up the people we honor tonight and all those folks that we work with around the Commonwealth. Mass Humanities has been doing this work for almost 50 years through grants and programs and partnerships that create opportunities for people to engage the humanities, to make better decisions about their lives, about their neighborhoods, and about our democracy. This summer, Mass Humanities partnered with 21 communities for reading Frederick Douglass together, a 12-year-old program that brings people together to read Douglass's 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. These readings take place in Plainfield and Jamaica Plain and Weston and Roxbury and Worcester and Somerville and Marion and Sharon on town commons in front of city halls and online. I was very fortunate to attend the one on the 4th of July at the South Amherst Congregational Church. It was on a patch of grass at the intersection of three roads that quickly filled up with almost 300 people there to read a speech that was 160 years old. 
We were greeted by a choir, and the event opened with remarks by Dr. Emilcar Shabazz of UMass Amherst, who noted that standing there, we were in the footsteps of abolitionists. We were in underground railroad territory. And as people read the speech from elementary school students to old folks like me, I looked around and thought about how brave they all were. That they were our people, people like you, who understand that time and time again, the people of Massachusetts have found a way, often with the humanities in hand, to build a more equitable nation. This has been a trying time, but I deeply believe that this is a moment for the humanities. Tonight, you're going to meet our four honorees who are groundbreaking humanists. It's really my pleasure now, though, to introduce you to another groundbreaking humanist, Tina Scott, graduate of the Clemente course in the humanities. My name is Christina Marie, born of a single mother of four, who did her best to raise us properly. Born from the lineage of a whaler, a sharecropper, an entrepreneur, I am proud to carry on the legacy of strength and excellence. Mount Holyoke was never in my imagination. It was just such a far away thought I didn't go to college after high school because it was just too much of a financial burden. My mother could never afford to send any of us to college. I started at Springfield Technical Community College and the semester before I graduate was when I started the Clemente course. And I really enjoyed what we were learning, philosophy, English, history. It just made me know more about what was going on in the world and think a little bit differently. Just the freedom to question. My name is Christina Marie, single mother of one, who was doing her best to raise him properly. The one she did at birth, but who loves him with everything in her being. I've been writing in some form since I was about nine years old. I got excited about reading James Baldwin for the first time. His writing, I think, is to me poetic, and I write poetry. I was actually scared of writing. <laughs> I wasn't confident. That was my biggest, biggest challenge. My professors would tell me, your skill is up here, but your confidence is down here. Let's get those even. I'm writing every day, now I have to write something. It's an integral part of my life. My name is Christina Marie, born on the 4th of July. I embody what that date represents. Independence, freedom, and indeed a firecracker. My English major gave me confidence to want to publish poetry. I'm really grateful to Mass Humanities and the Clemente Course for giving women and people like me an opportunity to explore my curiosity with the humanities. Now I know that I can go anywhere and that I do belong. Tina Scott, 
on Springfield, John Adams of Braintree, Larry Spotted Crowman of the Dipmuck, Sonia Nieto of Amherst, W.E.B. Du Bois of Great Barrington. Time and time again, there have been people from Massachusetts who illuminated our understanding of our world and our democracy. This spring, Mass Humanities was fortunate to host online civic engagement courses with graduates of the Clemente course. And these courses looked at the history of civic engagement from protests to voting rights. They also asked each student to think about their own lives and what it meant for civic engagement to be part of that. The courses started on January 5th. They culminated in a book titled, This is Your Democracy. Now think of the contrast here. Just in the same days that people were gathering to try and take control violently of the halls of government who were chanting, this is our house. People in the Clemente course were turning to one another, turning to history, reading John Lewis and telling each other, this is your democracy, yours and yours and yours. When we practice the humanities, we often have books around. You can see them behind me. You probably can see them behind you and you're gonna see more of them in the videos tonight. When we practice the public humanities, it's when we read together, when we learn with one another and when we share each other's stories. At Mass Humanities, we believe that that is a key step in civic engagement. When you and I can sit down and talk about the tough stuff of the past, then we're on the pathway to talking about the tough stuff of the future. This year, Mass Humanities funded 240 grants totaling $1.8 million to museums, libraries, cultural centers, community centers. These are the places that are the infrastructure for common ground, the places where we come together that are dedicated for you and I to be able to meet with each other on equal turf, to explore, to get resources, to learn stories. And in time of misinformation and division, they are the places that hold us together and we will need them to endure as we figure ourselves out of the mess that I think we all feel that we're in. At Mass Humanities, we're very proud to fund projects that range from saving jobs for museum workers, as we've done over the last month with our SHARP grants, to preserving the stories of our indigenous neighbors and recognizing the challenges they face today. We've helped fund websites that make it more accessible to people who are site challenged. And we've enabled translation of projects that make it more possible for more people to be part of the story of Massachusetts. I think we all know there's a reckoning going on with history. Our organization wants to put our shoulder behind that reckoning. And we'd like you to be with us to do that because we believe that we have an opportunity to be more equitable about the past and therefore to be more equitable about our present and our future. This work is done by people, people at the local level. When you support Mass Humanities, you don't just support this organization, you support hundreds of organizations that receive funding from Mass Humanities to do this work, to build common ground. I'm really grateful to work with the Board of Directors of Mass Humanities, as well as our staff, a talented, a hardworking group of people who cover the entire state, trying to figure out ways to make ideas into reality that improve people's lives. This event cannot take place without the leadership of our board and our staff, in particular, John Siraki and Michelle Wilson, who put this whole event together in partnership with our committee. I want to thank Al Griggs, Marita Rivera, Nancy Netzer, Leah Porvu, Jeff Musman, and our co-chairs, Denise Kegler and Amy McDonald, who I'm so happy to introduce you to tonight. Good evening, I'm Denise Kegler, co-chair of the 2021 Governor's Awards Dinner Committee. And I'm co-chair Amy McDonald. Thank you for being with us this evening. The panel discussion you are about to see is an excerpt from a larger conversation that will be made available to all registered guests following this evening's program. We hope you enjoy it. We are delighted to introduce this year's honorees, John Burgess, Annette Gordon-Reed, Sonia Nieto and Heather Cox Richardson in conversations with Mass Humanities Executive Director Brian Boyles. This evening, we have a great opportunity to speak with the four individuals receiving Governor's Awards this year. At this pivotal time in our democracy, I consider it a great honor to hear from John Burgess, Sonia Nieto, Heather Cox Richardson, and Annette Gordon Reed, people whose work has shaped the way we understand Massachusetts and our country. 
At Mass Humanities, we believe that the humanities should be central in decision making, whether that's personal or public, from the street corner to the classroom to the state house. As a parent, I think a lot about the experiences my young children are having right now, about the information they receive about their town or our democracy or their education. And I know that what they do today is gonna to impact the way that they understand the world going forward. So to start things off uh, this evening, I thought that we would begin at the beginning with some of the early experiences and sparks of humanities engagement that set our awardees off on the careers that they have enjoyed. And then I'm gonna start with you. Uh, in your new book, Juneteenth, uh, you describe your parents' decision to send you to an all white elementary school. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the way that shaped your understanding of history and the world around you. Well, it was a pivotal influence, I think. Uh, my parents were idealistic people. They thought that they were making a step for racial equality. And I knew even at six that this was a momentous thing. I talk about the fact that a relative went out to uh, one of the most expensive stores in Houston, the big uh, department there, Sackowitz, and bought a bunch of clothes for me. Um, and I had clothes, but she really, really wanted me to be dressed well when I went. This was her contribution to the civil rights movement. So that whole question of why it was a big deal that I had, that I was going to uh, a white school, that I was integrating our town school, drove home, came home to me very, very early on. And I, and I wondered about why is this a big deal? You know, why is this something that's momentous? How did we get to a place where this was something that everybody was focusing on? And so that really did make me think about our past, it made me think about race, the question of race and the role that it played in my hometown where when I was a kid, when we went to the movies, black people sat in the balcony. And when I went to the doctor's office, there was a separate waiting room, a se separate and unequal waiting room um, for us. All of those things, those experiences made me think about the present and how the past had brought us to that particular point. So I, I would say going to that school, uh, having that experience was absolutely essential to my setting me on the road to thinking about history and the question of race in the United States. Sonia, you've done groundbreaking work as a scholar around children's books. I'm interested in your case, you know, what were the books you were reading early on and, and how that um, widened your understanding of the larger world? Thanks for the question, Brian. You know, I, I uh, unlike Annette, I went to a, um, a school in a poor neighborhood and uh, with all, almost all immigrant students. And when I started school, I spoke only Spanish. So of course that was a huge influence in my life. I wasn't reading yet. I, I wasn't one of those kids who went to school knowing how to read. I missed kindergarten. So I went into, into first grade, but I think I learned to read pretty quickly. And of course that changed my life. But um, you know what, I, I don't think I could have put it into words at that point, but it was clear to me that the kids who I saw in the books that we were reading, which were basal readers for the most part, uh, didn't, didn't lead lives like we did. Uh, and so in terms of what they looked like, I mean, my family was pretty light skinned, so we could all have fit in probably, but they didn't speak Spanish. They didn't eat the foods that we ate. They didn't have the same experiences. Uh, so, you know, and yet, I pivoted towards books from a very early age. And there are things that, that really resonated with me, even though they were uh, books about other experiences. For example, I loved the book, Heidi. Now, why would I love that book? Um, I didn't have a grandfather. I didn't have any grandparents that I ever met. Um, I didn't live in Switzerland or wherever it takes place. Um, I didn't live in a loft, but I read all the time like Heidi did. And we had very strong relationships in my family. And so I guess I could really connect with that. And in the same way I connected with little women, uh, you know, we, our lives were so different. And yet I was Joe, I was really Joe. I was the, the girl who read all the time. 
So, uh, you know, this taught me later on that it's really, really important to have books for all kids that they can connect with because of their own backgrounds, their languages, their identities, their families, their histories. And at the same time, it's really important that they have books that expand their perspectives and their vision. Uh, and so I had those. I didn't have the first, you know, but I had those that really expanded um, my perspective and my vision about who I was. And, uh, and it was only later, much later. I mean, I never read a book by a Puerto Rican until I was in college. Uh, I never had a Puerto Rican teacher. <clears throat> and so all of that really influenced me, I think, to um, not only become a teacher, but to do research on Puerto Rican children's literature and why it was so important for me and, and for my kids and my, own, and my students as well uh, to have a broader vision by having themselves in the picture because otherwise they were out of the picture. I think this idea of the family classroom is really, really important, but also these narratives that are submerged um, or not opened up to you until you really go out there into the world. John, there's a great article on our website, masshumanities.org, um, where you talk about um, growing up in a family where your parents really hadn't had a lot of educational opportunities. Can you talk about the conversations you had with them? Because they do seem to be, though, very um, interested in the outside world and in politics and in current events. I'd be happy to, and it ties in with the comments that were made just before about the role of the, of the family. Uh, and the path of my mother and father, uh, they were both coming out of the Depression, so my mother never finished high school. My father ultimately became a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, but only because the U.S. Navy put him through college uh, during the Second World War, so different paths. Uh, and with my mother, it, I think, was a real challenge in the 1950s uh, for her. She hadn't graduated high school. She was very interested in history and global affairs. Uh, when I look back at it, I think her life was somewhat isolated. And as a result, she simply treated us uh, children as people to talk about these matters with. I, I still remember uh, her telling me when I was six or seven, I can't remember it, that Hugh Gateskill, uh, who was a labor politician in the UK, had died, and he'd been a really great man. And I was like, at the time, okay, whatever. But I realized in retrospect, my mother was following labor politics, you know, in, in Wakefield. And uh, evidently, she had really no one to talk to about it than her son uh, and uh, daughter. But, but that was fine, because it really gave a chance, uh, I think, for me early, to understand that that was part of uh, what one should be interested in. And there were really no limits on what you should be interested in. Um, and encouraging me to read, um, the, there was a history series called Landmark Books, which she would bring lots of back. I'm sure if I saw one now, I'd decide it was like completely wrong in lots of directions, but it didn't matter. It was a set of narratives that, that really got me interested. Um, for my father, the path was a little different uh, because he was able to go first to Tufts and then to Harvard. Uh, but in his case, I think that it was really um, a commitment to any kind of, of knowledge. He really was, in addition to being a scientist, interested in, in the blues, which again was not something terribly big in suburban Wakefield in the 1950s. And, uh, played uh, blues harmonica and exposed me to a, to a whole set of things which were very different. Uh, so that that family um, uh, background, as, as said earlier, really made a huge difference. And for me, uh, the lesson of how much it was important to them uh, was one I carried, uh, carried with me uh, throughout the rest of my life. The blues are such a gateway I feel like to understanding America, actually, particularly if you're not growing up in the places from which it emerged. So that's, that's super interesting to me. It took me a long time to figure that out, but I eventually <laughs> fell to it. Yes, absolutely. John, I collect those landmark books if you ever want some of them. Oh, you do? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. 
<laughs> and they're better than you think they are. That's great. You know, they're not, I, they're, I, they're, they are what they are, but they still exist and you can still get them. And I will add very cheaply because not everybody wants those landmark books. <laughs> well, that's great to hear because I really do think they, for a lot of, uh, you know, kids of a certain age were a gateway to history. They were on, they were on just, uh, they were on weird things. I mean, it wasn't sort of like the normal thing you got in classes that were, you know, presidents or whatever. It was like the Erie Canal or something. <laughs> You'd be like, wait, wait, I've never heard of the Erie Canal. And, and it was kind of a different way into our history. Yeah. One of the virtues, I think. Yeah. I want to stay on a hopeful note but also ask, I think, an important question um, for the four of you, which is, as we look at the deep challenges we face as a country and as a world, and as people who both teach and study and certainly reflect on these things, what role do you see the humanities playing in the coming years uh, in a positive way? And what are the challenges for the humanities given the context in which we all work today? I'll start with you, Heather. Well, I think that, um, that We've, we've all, but maybe particularly Annette, put our fingers on the fact that uh, with the pandemic, people have turned to the humanities. And that's one thing I have really seen in the letters I get and in the, the, con the contact I've had with people across the country who are reaching back not only for um, for their history, but also for their, their art, you know, amazing paintings and photographers and fabric artists and sculptors and graphic designers and people who are sort of saying, you know, this is what really matters. And this is what bridges are, you know, the differences between different groups of people. So that is an element of hope. But the, the thing that, that, it, that interests me right now in terms of the humanities and in terms of what mass humanities does, um, as opposed to sort of more generally how humanities can rebuild a shattered society, is that especially because people were stuck at home, not able to go to their jobs, uh, and, and distanced from their family members whom they connected with over Zoom through cooking or whatever, um, I wonder about how our country in the future might um, do the sort of things that mass humanities are, is doing, going ahead and reaching out in a continuing ed level or to people who are no longer in the K through 12 um, uh, or K through 16 group to learn history, for example. And the idea of permeating our society more fully with the humanities um, that have been perhaps neglected in the last 40 years in America at a national level, seems to me like it, this is a moment that could happen and, and to my mind should happen. So, um, so I have hope both for the country, but also for the future of humanity, so long as we don't say, oh, okay, now we had that two-year interlude, we're going back to the way things have been since the 1980s. So as Denise and Amy said, uh, you'll get the full video from that conversation. You can see from the smile on my face that just remembering it uh, brings me a lot of joy. We actually got into a really interesting conversation about uh, music and the way that music shapes people's experiences and their understandings and how it has really a uh, humanities element to it. Mass Humanities operates in Massachusetts. There are state humanities councils all across the country. I wanna welcome several of the executive directors of those state councils who also serve as affiliates for the National Endowment for the Humanities. We also receive support from the Mass Cultural Council and my friend Michael Bobbitt is also on here tonight and I wanna thank him for his leadership. The legislature has been extremely great, uh, excuse me, generous uh, with Mass Cultural Council and with Mass Humanities allowing us to build more and more funding opportunities for people all around the state. So I want to thank the legislators that have come in tonight. Uh, this is the Governor's Awards in the Humanities. Governor Baker has been a great ally for the organization, and I'm very grateful for him for introducing tonight's uh, awardees, Sonia Nieto, Heather Cox Richardson, John Burgess, and Annette Gordon-Reed. Governor Baker? John Burgess practiced corporate and international law at the firm Wilmer Hale for more than three decades. He currently teaches Law of the Sea at Tufts University's Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and has been a visiting professor internationally. Congratulations, John. John Burgess was born in Waltham, Massachusetts, to parents who fostered their son's intellectual curiosity from a young age. John attended Roxbury Latin, 
where he joined the debating club and became enthralled by literature and current events. Inspired by an intense interest in rhetoric and building arguments, John became a corporate and international lawyer. During his 37-year career, John represented clients throughout Western Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. He spent a year at the U.S. State Department during the START treaty negotiations and was part of the team that fought for and succeeded in banning short-range nuclear missiles in Europe. His experience abroad, he says, has helped inform his appreciation of the humanities at home. John serves on the board of WBUR as a trustee of the Roxbury Latin School and was on the board of Mass Humanities from 2003 to 2010, the final two years as chair. John currently teaches Law of the Sea at Tuft University's Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. For ongoing excellence in governance and jurisprudence with diverse cultural and educational institutions in Boston and beyond, we're proud to present John Burgess with a 2021 Governor's Award in the Humanities. I am deeply grateful to receive this award from Mass Humanities and the Mass Humanities Board. I'm also honored and, and humbled to be in the same room, even though it's a virtual room, with this year's other recipients, each of whom have demonstrated a deep commitment to scholarship and its intersection with civil life within the Commonwealth and beyond. For me, it's a special honor to be able to receive an award from an organization I care about as much as Mass Humanities. The Mass Humanities Board, its director, Brian Boyles, his predecessor, David Tabaldi, its staff and its supporters have a sustained dedication to sharing the excitement of the humanities across the Commonwealth, as well as exploring and preserving the principles that underlie how the humanities sustain civic society. That commitment is especially important in these times and the challenges which we face as a society and a political body, again, here in Massachusetts, nationally and globally. Finally, I'd like to briefly thank my family, teachers and friends who over the years have exposed me to the challenge of discussing ideas from a variety of perspectives and help to foster an abiding love for the humanities. Thank you. Annette Gordon-Reed is the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard. Gordon-Reed has won 16 book prizes, including the Pulitzer Prize in History in 2009 and the National Book Award in 2008 for the Hemingses of Monticello. Congratulations, Annette. Annette Gordon-Reed grew up in segregated East Texas in the 1960s. Her father was a hardworking small business owner, and her mother was an English teacher who instilled in her a love of books and of stories. Annette attended Harvard Law School, but instead of pursuing a career in law, she was drawn to teaching and writing. Her first book, published in 1997, lit a spark that culminated in her 2008 work, The Hemmings of Monticello, An American Family, which won a host of awards, including the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. She also received the National Humanities Medal in 2009 from President Barack Obama and was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2011. Annette is currently the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard and the president of the Ames Foundation of Harvard Law School. Her most recent book, On Juneteenth, weaves together family and national history to revise our understanding of the holiday and America itself. For challenging our perceptions of history, leadership, race, and social justice, we are honored to present Annette Gordon-Reed with a 2021 Governor's Award in the Humanities. I would like to thank the Board of Mass Humanities for bestowing the Governor's Award upon me and to congratulate the three other recipients whose biographies show 
that I am in distinguished company, indeed. This award means a great deal to me coming from an organization that champions something about which I care very deeply, the humanities, which enrich all of our lives in so many ways. I only hope that my work continues to be worthy of the honor that I've received today. Thank you again. Sonia Nieto is a professor emerita of language, literacy, and culture in the College of Education at the University of Massachusetts Amherst campus. Her teaching has spanned early elementary through doctoral education, and her research is focused on the education of students of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, with a special emphasis on Latino students. Congratulations, Sonia. A native of Brooklyn, New York, Sonia Nieto's early teaching experience includes a public school in the Bronx that was the first fully bilingual school in the Northeast. Her university career began at the Puerto Rican Studies Department at Brooklyn College. In 1975, she moved to Amherst, Massachusetts, where she completed her doctoral studies and launched a long and rich academic career. Sonia's work focuses on questions of diversity, equity, and social justice in education. She's written and edited dozens of journal articles, as well as 13 books. Today, Sonia is a professor emerita of language, literacy, and culture at the College of Education, University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's received numerous awards for her scholarly work, teaching, advocacy, and activism, including nine honorary doctorates. She said that when she was teaching, she often made a point of telling her students they were not there just to become teachers, but to be able to lead a consequential life. For pioneering multiculturalism in education and instructing generations of new teachers in the values of inclusion, we're proud to present Sonia Nieto with a 2021 Governor's Award in the Humanities. My father had to leave school in fourth grade to work on a farm in the hills of Peñuelas, the small town he was born in, in, in Puerto Rico, becoming the sole breadwinner for his widowed mother and the remaining six siblings in his home. My mother was more fortunate, attending school until sophomore year in high school. They left the island for the States in 1929 and 1934, respectively, meeting and marrying in New York city and, and starting a family. Although neither of them had the benefit of a formal education, they made it clear to us though, through both words and actions that they understood the value of education. While we didn't have the resources that more privileged families take for granted, my parents pushed us to do well in school and they did what they could to help us succeed. It's no accident that I became a teacher and later a professor, a teacher educator, and an advocate for public education. It's a profession that has brought a great deal of joy and meaning to my life. Of course, I couldn't have articulated it when I was six or seven, and I made the decision that I wanted to be a teacher. But somehow I knew even then that public education would be my profession and my passion. The humanities have especially guided me in life, teaching me that thinking critically, writing persuasively, listening to different viewpoints respectfully, learning from history, and being open to different experiences and perspectives, that these are the skills that, uh, what, of what it means to be an educated person. The Governor's Award in the Humanities is a phenomenal individual honor for me, and I'm deeply grateful for it. But besides being an individual honor, more than anything, it's a tribute to the value of public education and to people like my mother and father who didn't themselves have access to education, but who struggled every day to make sure that their children could know the, the privileges that we've known it's also a tribute to other kids of color, to those who live in poverty, and to the many who've been marginalized in our society, who still struggle to learn in schools that increasingly turn their backs on them. The support and love of my family has made my life possible. 
my parents, Federico Cortez and Esther Mercado, my siblings, Lydia and Freddy, Angel, my loving husband of 54 years, our daughters, Alicia, Marisa and Jasmine, and our other beautiful grandkids, including the newest member of our family, our great grandson, Amir. It's because of them that I'm here today. They remind me every day why public education is still worth fighting for and why it's indispensable to any society that strives to be based on democratic values. Heather Cox Richardson is professor of history at Boston College and the author of six acclaimed books about American politics. Richardson is a national commentator on American political history and the Republican Party. Congratulations, Heather. Heather Cox Richardson was born and raised on the coast of Maine. After attending Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, she went on to study at Harvard University, where she received her BA and PhD. She is the author of six celebrated books about American history. Her most recent, How the South Won the Civil War, explores Confederate ideologies and the trajectory of modern conservatism. Heather has taught at MIT and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She's now a professor at Boston College, where she teaches 19th century American history at both the undergraduate and graduate level. Between 2017 and 2018, Heather co-hosted the NPR podcast, Freak Out and Carry On, and she also co-hosts the podcast, Now and Then. She also began writing the nightly newsletter, Letters from an American, which has made her one of the most successful independent journalists in the country. Every morning, over 600,000 subscribers tune in for her take on how current events rhyme with those in history. For helping millions of Americans understand the historical roots of recent social and political challenges, we are proud to present Heather Cox Richardson with a 2021 Governor's Award in the Humanities. Good evening. I am deeply honored to receive the Governor's Award and to be recognized with three such outstanding individuals. I'd like to thank the Board of Directors and staff of Mass Humanities, Executive Director Brian Boyles, and Governor Charlie Baker for including me in this honor. I'd also like to thank the many people who helped me figure out the news, convey it, share it, think it through, and support each other. The humanities are about all of us. The motto of mass humanities is that democracy demands wisdom. It is the humanities that create that wisdom as they hold up to us mirrors of human life, inviting us to think deeply about what it means to be human. And of course, what it means in this critical era of American democracy, what it means to be an American. As a historian, I have tried to contribute to this quest for wisdom by providing the factual foundation for that inquiry into our country and into humanity. While this is a particularly fraught time in our nation's history, it is also, I think, one of extraordinary excitement and opportunity as so many of us have turned to the humanities to connect with one another and to explore what it means to create a society that lives up to the principles it has so often articulated. I am so very honored to be with you all tonight. In an earlier troubled time in American history, Frederick Douglass wrote that the duty of today is to meet the questions that confront us with intelligence and courage. Tonight, we turned our attention to educators, truth seekers, and their ideas. We celebrated people who have led the way, and we have celebrated all of you all for the work you do to make this work possible. In the coming years, Mass Humanities has a new direction, and in doing that, we hoped to become the leader that you want us to be, to continue to build more opportunities for people to do things like what Annette Gordon-Reed did, look into the archives and find truths that illuminate our democracy's origins and the path forward. To do what Annette Gordon, excuse me, do what Sonia Nieto has done, revolutionizing public education and the way we understand language. Next week, Mass Humanities will announce 
the six host sites of a Smithsonian traveling exhibition aimed at building civic engagement in small towns. The Museum on Main Street project is going to travel around Massachusetts looking at changes in rural life and importantly, bringing people together to talk about the challenges they face. Now, we haven't announced uh, these towns yet, but they have been chosen. Each of them has uh, populations of less than 12,000. Some of those folks are here with us tonight. I just want to, um, as much as possible on Zoom, uh, applaud the people of Athol, Hall, Sheffield, Montague, Essex, and Rutland. We look forward to working with you, not just in the coming months, but for a period of three years in civic engagement and the humanities. Through our Expand Massachusetts Stories grants, which will be announced in three weeks, Mass Humanities and you, with your support for Mass Humanities, will make possible projects like the work at Okiteo Cultural Center in Asheville, like the Royal House uh, and sla Enslaved Quarters in Medford's exploration of slavery in Medford. Jewish oral histories, there are projects that are looking at the origins of house museums, there are projects that are bringing more people to the streets of Holyoke to understand the contributions of Puerto Rican people in that city. As we do that work, we need your support to get more people involved and crucially to let more people around the state know about this work. The traditions of our Haitian neighbors, of our Venezuelan neighbors, of our Nipmuc neighbors belong in the great tradition of Massachusetts. And until we have an understanding that all of those voices deserve to be part of that story, we can't truly move forward and build a more equitable commonwealth. With your support, we can do that work and make civic engagement the center of humanities work across Massachusetts. In addition, your support helps us bring the Clemente course to the Worcester Art Museum, to Codman Health Center in Dorchester. It helps us publish more of those books and make sure that the people in Clemente begin to participate actively in the projects we fund so that they can see themselves on the walls of the museums and their stories in the halls of power. Decision-making must be influenced by the humanities, crucially as seen through the voices we've heard from tonight. Now, you're going to go to breakout rooms soon, but I want you to continue to think of the Frederick Douglass reading that I talked about at the beginning of this event. And that moment that humanities creates where we are allowed and able to meet challenges together, to meet with each other, and to engage in a way that allows us to look forward. This has been a bright night in what has been a hard year. But it is a year that gives us great hope because we can look back and see the humanities work that's been done by our four awardees and all the folks that Mass Humanities works with around the Commonwealth. I hope you'll go into the breakout rooms and tell each other stories, true or not so true. Listen to each other and appreciate the opportunity to get to connect. In a time when we're always so far from each other, the humanities are that connective tissue that allow us to understand one another, to ask difficult questions, and to share our stories with a mutual respect born out of our understanding that we are all here to participate in this human experiment. Thanks so much for being with us. I hope you have a safe night and be well.